If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. again to our program. This is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. I want to thank you for being with us today. Uh, we're discussing in this current series the topic of Islam, known as the Muslim religion. In fact, the uh, title of our entire series here is called, Can the Muslim Religion Send Someone to Hell? In other words, if you believe the Muslim religion, if you believe Islam, if you believe what Muhammad, the apostle, the prophet of Islam taught, Will believing that send you to an eternal hell and punishment by God Almighty? We want to answer that question. And the way to do it is to get into the Islamic religion, get into the teachings of Muhammad, get into the understanding that Muslim religionists have, and find out if it truly can send you to hell. And our chief analyst for this series is our own Christian Answers Director of Research, Steve Morrison. Steve, it's always great to have you here. Thank you, Larry. As we discuss this, this very important topic, and it really relates to a lot of people out there, uh, here in America and around the world. In fact, uh, if my memory serves me correct, Islam world, globally is like the number two religion behind Christianity. That's right. It's uh, around, it's kind of hard to count population, but roughly around a billion people are Muslims. A billion people, and here in the United States where we're filming this, uh, last I heard there's over six million Muslims here in America already due to immigration and things of that nature. Uh, six million, maybe even greater than that. Yeah, by now. I mean, that was an old statistic I, mm -hmm. I, I had seen, and I haven't checked on any updates. So I know the uh, a Muslim religion, uh, the population is expanding not only here but uh, globally so this this subject is of vital interest I think to Muslims and non-Muslims alike well anyway uh, this is show number three in our series we've already discussed uh, a couple of topics in in the past uh, and uh, we don't have time to recap everything we will recap a little from our previous show which was uh, is the Quran from God and uh, in fact, just to go ahead and lead us into this subject, let's uh, recap a little bit, Steve, and some of the things that our viewers who may just now be tuning in might have missed if they hadn't caught the previous uh, show in this series. We've got, is the Quran from God? And uh, they're looking at a chart right now that says how Muhammad got his messages. Could you just briefly explain that? Well, when Muhammad got his messages, they were actually fairly, I guess, uh, spectacular. He'd have ringing in his ears. Sometimes his heart would beat rapidly. Uh, his face would turn red. He'd breathe heavily. He'd fall on the ground with both eyes open toward the sky. He'd sweat profusely. And he'd see and hear things that other people didn't hear. And, you know, some might say, oh, this is a sign that he was touched by God. Others might say, oh, this is demonic. The uh, third possibility is this might have been a, sort of an epileptic fit to where he got that. Okay, and uh, how was the Quran, Quran written down? Well, for, uh, Muhammad didn't actually write any of the Quran on paper himself. Uh, we don't think that he was able to write. Um, but fragments of the Quran were written down by people who heard it on palm leaves, bones, and rocks, according to Bukhari uh, 6509. Uh, there was no organized Quran prior to his death, but there were four people who collected the Quran. Um, and uh, some verses did not survive because some of the people who, there were those who had memorized these verses and they died in battle. This is according to the Bukhari Hadith, uh, 450, uh, uh, volume 4, verse uh, 57, 62, 69, and 299, and volume 6, 509. And afterwards, it still needed compiling later and standardizing by Uthman. 
Yeah. We'll get into that in a later episode. All right. Okay, internal contradictions in the Quran. Well, you know, was the first to believe Moses or was it Abraham? And if either of them believed the original message of Allah that was uh, then was that message lost in which Allah you know lost his word or um, what another one the Holy Spirit appeared to Muhammad in Surah 16 102 and Surah 26 192 to 24 which sounds almost like Christian uh, Muslims today uh, some of them that it, when in the Holy Spirit in the book of John they try to say that that's Muhammad which mm -hmm. this would say opposite um, it says Muhammad I'm sorry Allah himself appeared in the form of a man to Muhammad according to Surah 53, 2 to 18, and Surah 81, 19 through 24. And uh, many surahs show that the earth was created in six days. The Bible, by the way, also says six days with God resting on the seventh day. However, Surah 41, 9 through 12, said the surah was created in eight days. And there was two days, uh, plus a separation between verses 9 and 10, plus four more days, which you can't fit in two days, even if there wasn't a separation, plus two days after that. So looking at this chart, we find that the Quran says in one place that the earth was created in six days, and in another place it says it was created in eight days. We find that the Quran says in one place that Moses was the first to believe, but in another place the Quran says Abraham was the first to, right. to believe. And so we have all these problems. Now, just, just for the sake of clarity here, I'm just fascinated. Allah appeared in the form of a man. Why, why is that problematic? Uh, if he appeared in the form of a man uh, to Muhammad, then if God is Almighty, why couldn't he appear in the form of a man as Jesus Christ? See, and so the problem is they don't like the idea that Jesus was God in, in flesh, uh -huh. uh, just like the scripture teaches in the Bible, which they deny. And so here's something similar, and it's something they don't like to think about because yeah. it, it, it's so problematic for them with the, the Christian position. Okay, got that cleared up. Now what about external problems? Well, uh, in, in Surah 18, 85 through 86, it says that a ruler called Zulkarnayim followed the setting sun and found that it went down into the waters of a muddy spring. Now we already established from the other show that uh, particularly from a Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran, uh, this could be uh, Alexander the Great of historical fame, the great conqueror. Could be. Could be Cyrus, could be a, a, a king of Yemen, could be somebody else, but 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 it, it's a moot point who it is. So the point is, is the sun does not really go down in the waters of a muddy spring. Okay, what about a false accusation of Jews? Uh, they called Ezra Uzair, uh, Yusuf Ali in the footnote says is Ezra, uh, the son of God. And there is no sect of Jews um, that that we have evidence of that is ever called Ezra a son of God. So it's uh, just a false, I mean, this is just a statement that's only found here in the Quran and right. nowhere else. Right, right, right. It, it, it's, all, it's only Muslim writings that have Ezra being the son of God. What about Muhammad and the Irish Americans? Okay, uh, it, it, you would be surprised if you saw, if, if the Quran said that Muhammad talked with Irish Americans. <laughs> that would be a historical anachronism because Irish Americans as a people didn't exist until you know many uh, millennia later. Well, the Quran does not say that, but there are some equally surprising statements that a Samaritan molded the golden calf, and the Samaritans did not exist until later. And you don't have to read all these for the sake of brevity here so we get on to our main topic, but all of these are, are problems that uh, are like anachronisms. Mm -hmm. uh, that, anachronisms. Yeah. Right, anachronisms that uh, just don't really fit with the historical facts. Right. So, uh, okay, what about uh, Muslim morals? Well, there is some in common uh, with uh, Muslim morals and Christian and Jewish morals. Uh, for example, the Muslims uh, believe that you, do not have, you should not have idols, worship idols, you shouldn't even sell idols, you shouldn't have any fortune-telling items. Uh, Christians believe the same from the Bible. Uh, the the uh, Muslims uh, differ from Christian morality in that in the Hadith it said in some circumstances sex with unwilling captive women is okay. Okay, uh, robbery and revenge and hatred and, and cursing and assassination and even killing entire villages is okay. When you're at war with infidels or when you're at war even with Christians and Jews who haven't submitted to Islam and you know pay the tax and everything. Uh, Muslim is not just Muslim, Muslim doctrines are different, but Muslim emphases are different. All right, Christians emphasize prayer, uh, talking to God, communicating with God, uh, praying what's on your heart. 
Muslims emphasize prayer too, but just like the Pharisees in Jesus' time emphasized all the external rituals, uh, most Muslims uh, it, it emphasize the uh, the proper time to pray. Uh, it's important to to, um, to pray in the right position and facing toward Mecca, and it's more the mechanics um, rather than rather than just um, you know. In, informal talking to God whenever you want to talk to God. I don't talk to my wife and say, listen, honey, I'm going to talk to you six times a day. I'm going to do it in a certain position, and I'm not ever going to talk to you besides that. Mm -hmm. I love her. I talk to her when I, I feel like talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good point. Now, what about this next one? You're talking about your wife beating your disobedient wife. Well, uh, Surah 434 uh, says to beat or scourge your wife. Now, Muslims, they have to accept that because it's in the Quran, but Muslims that I've talked to typically say, well, that just means to tap lightly, or, you know, to, I don't know if you can beat lightly, but whatever. But anyway, the Arabic word is the same word for a violent criminal or, or, or camel. So at the very, very best, uh, you know, a Muslim could say is that this would be ambiguous because the word can, you know, can mean beat violently. Actually, though, uh, we can see that at the time it was written, it was understood that you beat just like you beat a slave. Like this one here, beating slaves from yeah. the uh, al Bakari Hadith. Yeah, you should spare his face. I guess there's no permanent damages on his face, though permanent damage in other parts of the body, you know, you know, presumably might be okay. But but they can beat their wives. And, uh, and in fact, the, the Hadith here, as, you, as a viewer sees, tells you about that. Right. And, and, and Hisham said he beats his wife as he beats his slave. And there's nothing that says that uh, Muhammad uh, 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 said beat your wife as, as you beat a slave, but the context of this shows that they did it, and there's nothing that said in which Muhammad said that he you know, corrected him and said that was wrong either. Okay, where does it say in the, the Quran uh, that you can, uh, or in the Hadith, that the husbands can be beaten by their wives? Nowhere at all. I mean, that doesn't sound fair. You mean a wife can't beat her husband back? No, nope, she can't get male relatives to beat her husband or, or anything else. It, it's just a one-way thing. Man. Oh, well. I guess women lose out on that deal. Yeah. But uh, here we got differences in tone and message. And this basically shows the difference. And uh, people can just read that what Jesus said there. But it seems to contradict uh, some of the teachings we were just going over and some of the sayings in the, by Muhammad in the, in the Hadith and also the Quran. Mm. So uh, that was kind of a brief update of our, our previous show but now what we want to do and we were just mentioning several of these is go into a more in-depth uh, study of the hadith themselves mm -hmm. that now our first chart here on this subject as the viewers at home see now we've been mentioning the the the, the bukhari hadith but there's lots of hadith and people are seeing right there, there's over two hundred thousand hadith uh traditions about muhammad so uh Give us some background on this. Well, uh, all kinds of people uh, wrote all kinds of things about Muhammad. Some of it, m even Muslims today would agree, was really, really ridiculous and, and, and silly. Like uh, it would smell like perfume when he went to the bathroom you, you, and uh, things like that. So nobody accepts these, all these hadiths as authentic. But anyway, about 870 AD, a man who's called today Bukhari because he was from the city of Bukhari um, in Central Asia, he uh, sifted through all these hadiths and he collected 7,275 of them that he viewed as authentic. Okay, uh, other people uh, had hadiths too, and if you look behind me, there are three other hadiths. Uh, the, the, the Bukhari hadith, the Sahih al Bukhari, is the light tan ones. Uh, the Sahih Muslim. Uh, there are four volumes of that, and the Fiqh Usuna, there are five volumes of that, and then the much smaller Riyad Us uh, Salihin uh, it is just two volumes. And, uh, and these are collections of hadiths. Now, I ne we need to stop this for a second and say, well, uh, a Shiite or other kinds of Muslims might be looking at this and say, well, why are you bringing up the hadiths? Because I don't believe all the hadiths. Well, let me say an answer to that is culturally within Islam, I believe that the Hadiths are as or more important than the Quran. The reason for that is among Sunni Muslims, who make up around 85% or so of all Muslims, uh, the Quran plus the Hadiths uh, make up the basis of Muslim law. 
So when Muslims say things like, well, you shouldn't have any churches in Saudi Arabia, uh, you, uh, you have some of these laws and some of these legal penalties for various things, they base that on the Hadiths. Now the Muslims hold the uh, Quran, to, all Muslims hold the Quran to be higher authority than the Hadiths, but there's so much more of the Hadiths in the Quran is why I make the statement that from a practical matter, for Muslim law, I, I, I think that the Hadiths have maybe more of an influence just because there's more of them. And you're talking about the, particularly in these countries, these Muslim countries out there that hold to Islamic law. Right. Uh, but now I think in the Iran, for instance, that's more Shiite yes. Muslim, it, it, whereas uh, you got Saudi Arabia, which is Sunni. Right. And then you've got these other Muslim countries out there that are, are mainly, I guess, Sunni uh, they, as well. They, uh, they, they're uh, like Kuwait, it, for it, instance. It, yeah, they're all mainly Sunni, uh, except that there is a strong minority of Shiite in southern Iraq. There is a Shiite minority in in Afghanistan and smaller Shiite minorities in other places. And the Alawites are strong in Syria and in Lebanon, and you have other kind of. Okay, so you've got all these Muslim countries and in, in their populations. But uh, they, they've got laws that govern their land. Right. And you're saying that these hadiths that are sitting behind you here uh, form a lot of that law that these people living in these countries are living by. Right. And, and, and while the Quran, Quran is universally viewed as a higher authority, you know, it's a smaller book than those. And so the others have more, more of an influence. And, and a lot of times when Muslim scholars want to get a better understanding of something Muhammad might have said in the Quran, he can go to the hadiths to try to get it fleshed out, get a little more understanding of right. what might have been discussed in that particular verse mm -hmm. in the Quran. Yeah, so. and as a very rough analogy, not a perfect analogy, but a rough one is, you know, with Jews, they have the Old Testament, but then they have the uh, Talmud that, that interprets that. Well, the Hadith often reference various verses in the Quran and say, well, here's the background about what, why this verse was done. Right. Now, now, among Shiite Muslims, uh, some of them just don't pay attention to the Hadith at all. Some of them say that the Hadiths were all accurate, but they were done for specific times and specific places, and people incorrectly thought that they were universally applicable. Mm -hmm. All right, so Shiites do sometimes have some respect for the Hadiths, but they don't necessarily take everyone, you know, uncritically. But we're talking 85% of the Muslim population is Sunni. Right. So 85% of the Muslims you're going to run into would probably agree that the uh, Hadiths are authoritative, almost as equal, equal to the Quran. Yeah, typically, except you do have, you know, cultural Muslims that maybe haven't read the Hadith or the Quran, you know, of course. Okay, so you, uh, like we mentioned, there's liberal Christians and there's moderate Christians and there's nominal Christians. Basically, they're all the same. They just don't right. really believe. They just pick and choose what they want to believe out of the Bible. You have this in Christianity, which basically, to me, aren't real Christians because when you pick and choose, you just make your own religion anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, the same situation happens in Islam. You've got the, the, the true Muslims who really hold everything that the Muslim teachings uh, tell you to do, but then you've got a lot of other Muslims who are name only, but then they pick and choose right. what they feel like believing, and so they kind of, in a, in a sense, just create their own religion by picking and choosing what they want to believe in out of the Muslim teachings. Right, like, uh, you know, Muslim, I know a Muslim drinks beer, uh, a, a Muslim, you know, would go see prostitutes and he would say, well, it's okay because they aren't Muslim women, you know. What, what, well, those kinds of things are, are not actually the teaching of, of original Islam and they aren't actually in the Quran. Right, so people just make up their own religion as they go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just kind of picking up, it's like a, uh, someone said once, he said uh, they're like uh, dogs who pick up fleas. They walk along and they pick up this flea and that flea. Mm -hmm. Well, they go through and they pick up a little theology here and a little theology there and they think they got the God of, of Islam or the God of the Bible, depending on what perspective they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, let's go on then. We establish these are authoritative and stuff. The next chart is a, a quote out of the Bible. It's John 16, 2 through 3. It says, in fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me, end quote. And that's, of course, Jesus speaking. Mm -hmm. Steve, what do you want to comment on this? Well, if, if a Muslim wants to say that Islam was prophesied in the Bible, then I suppose they could and use this verse. <laughs> Uh, I don't actually know any Muslims saying that, but, but, but the Bible prophesies that there will be people who for religious reasons will be killing true believers from God. There will be evil people who are so deceived that they're doing that. Okay? We can observe that today. 
uh, we, we, we see, uh, you know, many Muslims, very devout, very devout on holy war. Um, they believe, generally speaking, that Christians worship the same God and they kill Christians because of that. And sometimes they do that in, in ways that are mentioned in the Hadith, and sometimes they actually even go beyond the Hadith, and, 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 and they do things just out of, I guess, cruelty and, 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 and hatred uh, that, that, uh, that actually are, are not said to do in Islamic tradition. They just do it anyway. Right. Anyway, uh, one thing that keeps reoccurring here is we study the teachings of Islam and, and biblical uh, teaching, is there's definitely a difference between what Islam teaches for the main part uh, with Christian teaching, and particularly the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says a lot of things, if it doesn't agree with what the Muslim already believes based on what he knows of the, the Quran and the Hadith. Or his own tradition. Yeah. His, right, or his own tradition, well, he just throws whatever Jesus had to say right out the window. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, there may be a lot of Muslims looking at that quote from Jesus and it doesn't make any difference at all uh, based on their own perspective. But anyway, uh, let's, let's go to the next chart. Go ahead, Steve. Tell us all, all about all it. Right. Uh, this is a hadith that I think is fairly pivotal from the Bukhari Hadith, Volume 4, Number 841. It's also repeated in Volume 9, Number 452. Now, Abu Huraira was a close companion of the Prophet. And he said, and the quote says, I said, O Allah's Apostle, that is Muhammad, I hear many narrations from you, but I forget them. He said, Spread your covering sheet. I spread my sheet, and he moved both his hands as the scooping something and emptied them in the sheet and said, Wrap it. I wrapped it around my body, and since then I have never forgotten a single hadith. And so, according to this hadith, everything that Abu Hurairah was blessed miraculously with perfect memory, so we could trust that everything that was from him uh, is going to be correct. So either this is uh, deceiving and misleading and wrong, and you have to throw this out, which means other hadiths may be totally wrong, or this is accurate, and the hadiths would be authoritative to the Muslim mind. So you can see how this kind of fits in with the Sunni understanding of the hadiths. Right, because uh, that is such a, a valid point, and the viewer at home needs to understand this when it comes to uh, these hadiths, because I, I, I know from personal experience that there's a lot of Muslims that when you bring up a hadith that could be particularly problematic, uh, it's easy for them to just say, well, that's just a tradition and we don't really buy into that or things like this. Well, then you've got to deal with something like this right here. Mm -hmm. Is this guy lying? Because if, if they're going to shovel that, uh, that hadith away, to get out of something that may be embarrassing to the Muslim position, mm -hmm. then they got to say this this hadith here is not telling the truth because he's got supposedly perfect memory, right. and these things are valid. So, it's kind of a being stuck between a rock and a hard place if if you try to deny what the hadiths are saying, mm -hmm. particularly when there's things that are problematic. Which, uh, believe me, as you keep watching the show, you're going to find out some things. That, but but just remember what Steve just brought up here on his chart. Uh, when it comes to these problematic verses. Okay, uh, let's go to the, the next chart. No worship of Muhammad. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, after Muhammad died, uh, uh, I believe it's Abu Bakr, has it, Allah said, Muhammad is no more than an apostle. And so Orthodox Muslims say Muhammad is the last and greatest uh, prophet of God, at least in the Sunni Muslims, uh, but he's not to be worshipped. All right. Now, actually, there are some sects of Islam that do worship Muhammad and do consider Muhammad nearest to God, and they say it in such an ambiguous way uh, that it's that way. And among some Alawite sects, they almost consider a trinity uh, or something that has been called a trinity, uh, which would be Allah uh, uh, and Muhammad, uh, and often uh, Ali sometimes, and sometimes it would be Solomon al-Farisi, um, the Persian who was Muslim and helped with the Battle of the Trench. Okay, but in the Quran and in the Hadith, um, it is very consistent um, that Muhammad was not to be worshipped. Okay, however, even though Muhammad was not to be worshipped, uh, they certainly had a high respect for Muhammad. In the Bukhari Hadith, Volume 3, Number 891, it says, By Allah, whenever Muhammad's apostle spitted, the spittle would fall in the hand of one of the, and it says, i.e. the Prophet's companions, who would rub it on his face and skin. If he ordered them, they would carry out his orders immediately, meaning that they carry out Muhammad's orders. If he performed ablution, which is ritual washing, then they would struggle to take the remaining water. And when they spoke to him, 
Uh, they would lower their voices and would not lo look at his faith constantly out of respect. So very high uh, view of him, it would almost, to use a, a Catholic term, almost like veneration of uh, Muhammad. You know, when he washed himself to try to, to take the leftover water from, from the wash. It reminds me of a lot of those Roman Catholic traditions where they've got a... Uh, you know, idols or, or places of veneration for the Virgin Mary, mm. and uh, they've got holy water, and and they're 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 doing special things, either walking on their hands and knees up steps, or or flagellating themselves for some reason. They're just doing some kind of religious ritual mm. in honor or respect for a figure. Right. And, and, and but 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 that's not limited to to Roman Catholicism. Uh, in Shiite Islam, uh, you have a, 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 some graves of some of the imams who are greatly honored, and people do flagellation, especially in the Sufi tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but with the Shiites, um, they, they they have great veneration for the saints, almost like in Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And uh, some Sunni Muslims kind of have a hard time understanding how Shiites can be doing that and and, 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 and be faithful to, you know, what the right. Brian right. did you say. So all I'm saying is this just looks from this quote of the uh, Bukhari Hadith, Volume 3, Number 891, it just looks similar to what we see in these other religious movements mm -hmm. of doing veneration, doing stuff right. when, when they're supposed to be According to the Islamic teaching, no worship, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I've often argued, particularly with Roman Catholics, about how this is idolatry right. to uh, to do this veneration of the Virgin Mary, or 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 uh, right, yeah. and, and or they got the wafer at the Roman Mass, and they consider that piece of bread the body of Christ, and they worship it literally as God. It's just a piece of bread. I look at that in the same sense as I'm looking at what these guys here are doing in the uh, Bukhari Hadith, <laughs> where, I mean, they're, they're struggling to get a little bit of the water right. that the prophet washed in, or a little spittle, and rub it on their face. I mean, it's like, it's like it has magic qualities mm -hmm. and all this type of thing. So it, it just looks very similar to what we see around the world in all these uh, religious superstitions and traditions. Okay, uh, let's go on to some more Hadith teachings, which are considered authoritative. Okay. All right, another, all right, another thing that, that uh, Muhammad taught was it said, the creation of the stars is for three purposes, i.e. as a decoration of the sky, as missiles to hit the devils, and as signs to guide travelers. So, if anybody tries to find a different interpretation, he is mistaken and just wastes his efforts. This is from Bukhari, Volume 4, Chapter 3, uh, which is before uh, 421. Okay. So, it's kind of... Um, the stars are to hit devils. Right. Now, you can't interpret that any other way. Otherwise, yeah. your efforts are, wor are, you know, are a waste of time. Right. So, uh, so it, from it, all it, your it, understanding... It's kind of interesting and cultural. Well, let me ask you, from all your understanding of uh, in your, your study of Islamic teachings, and surely you might have read something about what they say about it, how are you to take the stars and hit the devils with them? How, how is a Muslim... <laughs> or is the, are the angels supposed to... Use, what is the modus operandi? Okay, for I, hitting I, the devils with these stars. I, 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 I've never read anything that said that the Muslims were, were to do the, the throwing of the stars. Okay, so who does it? I mean, uh, it, I, I've never read actually who it's. What do they say about Houston? Is it is it Allah himself? Is it the angels? Uh, I, I, I haven't read any explanation. And, and from when I look at the sky, I see the stars at night. Mm -hmm. But they always seem to be in the same place. I mean, of course, the, the Earth is. Revolving, but I'm talking right. about you know the North Star is always there, the uh, constellation of Orion, and all these things are they're, they're always there. But if someone were to take a star and throw it at a devil, it seems like it would move, move or and, be destroyed, and not or be or yeah, or not be there anymore. Yeah. So the next time the Earth does its rotation on its axis and everything, it wouldn't be there to look at the next time. But uh, it seems like the stars are always in their place, and everything I know from astronomy, they're, st they're still there like they always have. So. Uh, I'm having difficulty understanding the modus operandi of hitting the devils yeah. with these stars. Well, I, I think there's one of the hadiths that, you know, maybe Muslims might just read and just kind of scratch their heads about. <laughs> okay, so this is a head scratcher hadith. Yeah. Okay. Well, like the next one. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next one then. Go ahead, Steve. All right. Uh, it went. Uh, in the Hadith, uh, Muhammad did a number of miracles, and one of the maybe more spectacular ones is it said that the Meccans uh, basically demanded that Muhammad show them a sign. And it says, they demanded the pagans to the Prophet to show them a miracle. The Prophet showed them the splitting of the moon, and it said, narrated Abdullah bin Masud. During the lifetime of the Prophet, the moon was split into two parts, and on that the Prophet said, bear witness to this. 
This is Bukhari, Volume 4, Chapter 6, um, and, uh, and also number 830, uh, page 533. So the point is that the Meccans wanted a sign, and Muhammad is saying, well, take a look at this. And, 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 and he somehow split the moon into it. All right, now a couple of problems with this. First of all, some Muslims have uh, maybe implied that, uh, well, maybe this was a future miracle, not a present miracle. Okay, but in this hadith it says Abdullah bin Masood said it was during the lifetime of the Prophet. Okay, so, you know, now there were lots of astronomers, not, uh, you know, in China had a lot of astronomers, and in the Middle Ages they had astronomers, and no one recorded the moon getting split to half. And no one recorded the moon going back together either. Okay, so th this, this is a, a very strange thing. Uh, um, uh, a couple other quotes, uh, the narrated Anus, that the Meccan people requested Allah's apostle to show them a miracle. S and so he showed them the splitting of the moon. Bukhari volume 4, number 831. Uh, and also you got another quote there. Yeah, narrated Ibn Abbas, the moon was split into two parts during the lifetime of the prophet. Okay, either it was split into two parts or it wasn't. And you know you can't say it was split into two parts invisibly or something like that because this was a sign that people saw, mm -hmm. allegedly. Allegedly from here, but uh, I, uh, apparently this is a this is a, a, a miracle that he performed, splitting mm -hmm. the moon in two. Uh, but uh, I guess there's no uh, no historical verification of that from uh, astronomical records kept over time or. Right. Anything like that, and and, and, and 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 you would think that there would be something, uh, you, you know, somewhere. This would this wasn't a local thing. This would be something that would be seen all over the earth, and there's nothing. It seems like there's traditions, just like uh, there's traditions about the uh, Noah's flood among mm -hmm. all kinds of cultures. I mean, right. the variations on the story vary but, uh, or differ slightly, mm -hmm. or, or major. Yeah. But the thing is, there's a story mm -hmm. that relates to the Noah's flood and all these cultures. But you don't see anything like that in co different cultures uh, about a, the moon being split in two. Right. That would be surely seen by all the inhabitants of the earth. Mm -hmm. And of course, I also, uh, you know, we covered this in the last show. Uh, talked about the sun sinking into a muddy spring. Right. Uh, we don't have any traditions in other cultures or uh, yeah. uh, populations that that talk about that either. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and by the way, you mentioned Noah's flood. Not only is it traditions in like Indian various Indian cultures and, and Mideast cultures and, and even American cultures, but even in the Quran, uh, they, they talk about Noah uh, uh, and, and, they, and they talk about the Great Flood. If you think Noah's Flood is not historical, then you're denying the Quran also. That's right. That's right. Okay, uh, let's uh, go on to this next one. looks kind of interesting. Where does Satan sleep? The devil okay. himself. Well, the Hadith is interesting. I think the footnote to try to explain it is even more interesting. It says, narrated Abu Huraira. Now remember, that was the guy that, you know, never forgot a single Hadith after this. <laughs> the Prophet said, if any one of you rouses from sleep and performs the ablution, which is ritual washing, he should wash his nose by putting uh, water in it and then blowing it out thrice. Thrice is three times. Because Satan has stayed in the upper part of his nose all night. So Satan, this great being, has stayed in... I guess everyone's nose or some people's nose all night. Well, and there's a footnote, it says one. Footnote one says, we should believe that Satan actually stays in the upper part of one's nose, though we cannot perceive how, for this is related to the unseen world of which we know nothing except what Allah tells us through his apostle. Okay, now the unseen world, you know, there are miracles, there are things that supersede spiritual laws. Uh, we're not here to deny the miraculous. But this just seems kind of strange that in this hadith here, actually not even in the Quran, and of course not in the Bible, um, there's this idea that Satan stays in this tiny spot um, in however many people, it didn't really specify, is this noses in Arabia, is this noses in the world, is this Muslim noses, everybody's noses, but, but somehow uh, Satan must stay there. It just seems kind of maybe petty. Well, we already, know, we already know from previous Islamic teachings in our show number one that we did in this series that the, uh, the Islamic teachings say that Satan could not touch Jesus. So obviously the devil could okay. not sleep <laughs> in Jesus' nose, okay. couldn't even touch him. Mm. Uh, uh, and so Jesus was immune to having the devil on his nose. And when we go to the biblical literature, we find nothing there right. in the Old Testament or the New Testament about the need to you know, take some water and then put it up your nose and then yeah and 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 how you've got a satanic being of the power of the devil as mentioned in the bible uh 
being able to be washed away by just getting mm. any old water right. and putting it up your nose. I mean, this would seem to be in a very important doctrine or teaching in dealing with the devil. And yet this tradition of putting water up your nose and then spewing it out to get the devil out of your nose, it would because it would be so theologically important, it would seem, mm -hmm. it would seem like it would at least show up in the Old Testament, show up in the teachings of Jesus somewhere, or maybe even show up in some other traditions around the world, some other religions, but do we really find it anywhere? No, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything. And, and, and it's like, however someone wants to practice, you know, a personal hygiene, that, you know, that, that's not the issue here. I mean, you want to put up water up your nose, that's fine. But, but, but when you elevate that to a religious teaching, uh, to say that this is the religious thing to do, um, you're pretty much like the Pharisees who had all these ritual washings in Jesus' time, and Jesus was harshly rebuked the Pharisees, saying, you're so concerned about all these washings and the outside stuff, and you neglect the heart, the inside stuff. You neglect the, the, the deeper things of the Spirit because you have so many little petty rules that, mm -hmm. that don't really matter. In fact, in the, in the New Testament, you find that the devil can be cast out in cases of demon possession, which is extraordinary events because we know that not everybody at least from the biblical record, is demon-possessed. Mm -hmm. It's only certain people are demon-possessed, and that's not even by the devil himself. We only find a, a few occasions where the devil was actually in someone, like Judas, for instance, mm -hmm. on the night of the betrayal. Uh, he possessed Judas. But what you find is, to get rid of the devil, you don't need to put water up your nose, biblically speaking. <laughs> you just cast him out by the name of in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ right. by the power of the Lord and the shed blood of Christ and that's how you overcome the devil Revelation 12 talks about the great war in heaven and what does it say in Revelation 12 they overcame him by the blood of the lamb right. so we're getting a totally different story here uh, that can't be substantiated outside of this hadith told by a guy who says, well, he wrapped himself in some, what was it, dirty clothes or something? And, yeah. He, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he can't he, forget anything. Yeah, yeah. He, Muhammad spread the air as if he were getting something and put it in his uh, covering and said, wrap yourself in it. Right. Now, all I'm saying here, this is pretty thin ground to believe major theological doctrines just because it says put some water in your nose and you don't really find any other references substantiated anywhere to, to, to back it up. Right. Okay. Uh, Let's go from uh, you know a nasal condition to uh, an insect condition. All right. Muhammad and insect science. Okay. Uh, there's another thing about insects too, but we're just going to discuss one of the two things. So the narrator Abu Huraira, the guy with the memory again. <laughs> the prophet said, if a house fly falls in the drink of any of uh, one of you, he should dip it in the drink, meaning the fly. For one of its wings has disease, and the other has a cure of the disease. So in other words, if you have a drink and a housefly uh, falls in, like with one wing, make sure that you dip the fly in again and get the other wing, because one will have the, the, the disease and one will have the antidote. Okay? And that sounds pretty strange and, and pretty pre-scientific. You know, pre There's kind of very interesting explanation that's given as a footnote in the Bukhari Hadith, and it's very long, but basically, to paraphrase it, uh, a Dr. Muhammad M. Al Samahi, chief of the Hadith department in the El Azhar University, has written an article, and he said the microbiologists have proved that there are longitudinal yeast cells living as parasites in the belly of the fly, and for the life cycle, they protrude through respiratory tubules of the fly, and these cells burst, and, and the content of the cells is an antidote for the pathogens which the fly carries. Okay, so let's analyze this a little bit from a, flu, uh, from a fluid flow perspective. You have this drink, and you have these uh, bacteria or, 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 or who knows what else on the fly that is in the drink, and of course they're spreading out everywhere. And he's saying that if, if you have a little bit of that in the drink, you dip the fly in again, which of course would have more bacteria and stuff, so that you would have some chemicals not even yeast cells, but just chemicals, and then just a few chemicals that might be in another part of the drink would, um, would, would, would nullify the whole effect of the pathogen. It doesn't sound like it makes much sense from a scientific perspective. Now, uh, I mentioned this before on one of our shows with Steve. You have a PhD in chemical engineering. In fact, you are a doctor, mm -hmm. Dr. Steve Morrison. Okay. In chemical but anyway, engineering. <laughs> but anyway you, you, you served time and you got your PhD mm -hmm. in chemical engineering, which is a scientific field. Now, from what you know of science, have you seen any studies or based on studies of concentrations or whatever uh, that would verify that one wing of 
the fly has disease and the other wing has an antidote. Uh, seems like this could be easily verifiable by just simply a microscope. What can you tell yeah. us scientifically? No, they, I, I've seen no studies of that at all. Um, the fact that yeast uh, live inside flies, that's very, that, that's very reasonable. But the fact that yeast would have an antidote inside them for every pathogen that the fly carries is just beyond belief. You know, and, 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 From a scientific and, point of view, it, it can't be verified. Right, right, right. I haven't heard, at least in America, of, of, of any medical departments where you have students, Islamic or otherwise, studying fly wings, you know, and, and as antidotes for disease. Maybe find out which part of the fly is an antidote and make a medicine out of it. But no, I haven't heard of that. <laughs> That's right. In fact, if that were really true, they could be getting antidotes from flies all the time right. and using it in the pharmacies. In fact, uh, in fact, if I go to H E B to pick up a prescription drug. Uh, at the pharmacy, I, uh, I probably would see, if this were true, I'd mm -hmm. probably see a whole different setup there. Instead of seeing all these medicine bottles and stuff, I'd probably see all these cages of flies. <laughs> and I'd see these guys reaching in there and grabbing flies and dipping them for my medication. Yeah. Uh, it seems like that would solve all our medical problems real fast. Yeah. So anyway, I, I think it's easy to say from this, this fly perspective, Muhammad and uh, insect science, it doesn't fly. <laughs> Sorry about that bad joke, but anyway, let's let's move on here as time flies. Oh, I did it again. Can't help myself. Sorry. Okay, Muhammad. I need an antidote so, for that, right? <laughs> I need an, yeah, I need an antidote for these jokes. But anyway, sorry about that. Uh, Muhammad sold slaves. Let's go with that. Okay. Uh, this this is something that many Muslims, and especially many Black Muslims, might not be aware of. Uh, but uh, more, it, in Bukhari, Volume Eight, Number One Eighty Two. It says that narrated Anas bin Malik, Allah's apostle was on a journey and he had a black slave called Anjasha and he was driving the camels. Also narrated Jabir bin Abdullah, a man among us declared that his slave would be freed after death. The, the prophet called for that slave and sold him. The slave died the same year. The footnote says the liberator was needy so the prophet sold the slave for him, permitting him to cancel his promise of freeing the slave after his death. This is Bukhari volume 3, uh, 7 11. Okay, what this is saying is that there is a man who promised his slave that he would free him in his will after he died. Okay, well, he was needy, and he needed some money. And if he sold the slave, then he would be breaking his promise. So he gave the slave to Muhammad, who sold the slave, and gave the money to the man. Okay, so it's kind of a way to wiggle out of your promise, which kind of says something about honesty here. Okay, um, I, I also... Now, we're, uh, we're definitely seeing also... Uh, Slave ownership here. Slave ownership and slave selling by Muhammad. And so uh, th this is this is actually ordained by Allah as a prophet. Right. Uh, apo uh, apostle. Yeah. Is and by the way, there is still slavery going on today, uh, and that is only one place in, in Islamic countries. Mm -hmm. And so there is only one world religion that still practices slavery, and it's not Hinduism or Buddhism or Christianity or Judaism, it's Islam. Okay, so if, if someone wants to become a Muslim, they're going to be part of a slave owner's religion. Okay, another thing about Muhammad's wife, Aisha. He said, he, Abin uh, Subair, sent her, Aisha, ten slaves whom she manumitted, which means freed, as an expiation for not keeping her vow. Aisha manumitted more slaves for the same purpose, so she manumitted forty slaves. She said, I wish I had specified what I would have done in case of not fulfilling my vow when I made the vow, so I might not have done it so easily. And footnote one says, Aisha did not specify what she would do if she did not keep her promise. This is why she manumitted so many slaves, so she might feel at ease as to the adequacy of her expiation. So the basic situation is Aisha promised something, and she didn't do it. And so, and to use a Catholic term, almost penance for that, uh, she had to free slaves, and she felt she had to sleep, free up to 40 slaves. So she freed slaves because she didn't keep her promise, and then she said, I wish I had specified what I had done, so I wouldn't have had to free so many slaves. <laughs> Okay, so that's kind of the attitude there. Right. Okay. And another one, kind of interesting one, Atta disliked to look at those slave girls who used to be sold in Mecca unless he wanted to buy. Okay, so you could buy slaves for all kinds of reasons. Um, at, you know, to till your crops or, or, or you could buy them as sex slaves or whatever. And Atta, being, I guess, more moral than some of the others, he didn't like to look at, at the female slaves who were being shown off in the auction except when he wanted to buy one. And uh, this is kind of interesting, too, because we have so many uh, uh, black people becoming Muslims, African Americans, mm -hmm. uh, and we have the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan and those guys that uh, 
started that religion. And so often I hear them saying Christianity is a white man's religion and Islam is a black man's religion and so forth. Mm -hmm. But isn't there Hadithic evidence that says Muhammad was white? Oh, there's a lot of evidence that he was white. His right. His were white. Um, I have, I have just here in front of me, volume one, Hadith number 63. And I won't read it all for lack of time. We got a lot of material to go through. But uh, you have this Hadith, you have uh, uh, Hadith volume number two, number 122, uh, number two, number 141, to name a few. There's also number one, number 367, uh, where it says Muhammad was white. Mm -hmm. So Islam is a white man's religion. He was a white man who had slaves. Mm -hmm. He was a, basically a white slave owner. Right. But, but when black Muslims start saying that Muhammad was black, uh, that's just a his, historical error, and, and most Muslims also recognize that Muhammad was, you know, was white, frankly. Right, based on the Hadithic evidence. We mm -hmm. don't even have to make this up. We just quote the Hadith, right. and it says Muhammad is white. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but Jesus, of course, was a Palestinian Jew. So these race things always come up. But, uh, okay, sex with slaves and captives. Okay. Uh, this is something that's kind of hard to swallow unless you read it yourself. <laughs> but uh, if you look at, uh, I'll, I'll say the sources first, Bukhari, Volume 3, Chapter 113, after number 436. Uh, also Bukhari, Volume 3, Number 432. And I'll uh, paraphrase part of this, but, but it said that, uh, Narrated Ibn Muharriz, I entered the mosque and saw Abu Sa'id al-Qudri and sat beside him and, and asked him about al Ezel which is a sexual practice. And they basically, they asked Muhammad, they said, well, we're away from our wives for a while, and celibacy is hard on us, and we have all these captives, including these women, and we want to have sex with them, but we don't want to have children by them, so like, what should we do? And Muhammad basically gave the answer, he says, well, if Allah has decreed us that a soul is going to exist, it will exist. And if Allah has decreed that it won't, then it won't. So basically, don't worry about it. All right, but, the context of this shows that, that when you have the captives, um, they're free to uh, have sex with them. Uh, also, this is related to another thing, which is a temporary marriage, to where you're married for only a particular time, maybe one month, maybe one night, uh, and they call that marriage, which kind of demeans all of marriage, you know, at least the, the concept of all of marriage um, with, with, uh, with that. So. Um, Islam has a very different view, despite what some might say, about marriage and about women. That's right. And speaking of that, we have Islam and women. Viewers at home are looking at this. What do you say, Steve? Well, uh, uh, th this is, you know, you ever wonder what Muslims look forward to when they die? Narrated Abdullah bin Qais al Ashari. The Prophet said, A tent in paradise is like a hollow pearl, which is 30 miles in height. And on every corner of the tent, the believer will have a family that cannot be seen by the others. Okay. So, so basically, when you get to the paradise, you've got this big tent, right. and you got a woman in each corner, right? And you can go and have fun with her, and I guess you'll have kids or whatever, and you just go to the other corners and have all these different women, right? And they'll have you know, have families. So, so, so it sounds, you know, maybe. <laughs> almost a, a little similar, not completely, but a little similar to Mormonism about, oh, even if you only have one wife on earth, uh, believers will have multiple, all these wives, and it doesn't specify how many corners a pearl has. Um, <laughs> could it, have a lot. It, it, well, it, 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 it's a tent, so it could be whatever, but, but you know, that's kind of what, what, what they look for, to kind of a sensual heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, Vikings, Mormons, and Muslims right. sort of have, have, have a right. sensual so, heaven. And uh, let's take a look then because uh, that, that idea is so con so different from the, the biblical idea of heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just totally foreign to what we understand from the Bible about heaven. Yeah, and, well, and like Jesus the even said, there's not going to be any sex in heaven. Right. You know, many people will be like the angels. But uh, now let's take a look at the Islamic concept of hell. What about uh, in in Islam, who primarily is in hell? Well, according to the Bukhari Hadith, volume 2, 161, and volume 1, 301, it, which is quoting from uh, volume 128, the prophet said, I was shown the hellfire and that the majority of its dwellers were women. And it goes on to say later that most of these women were ungrateful to their husbands. So the majority of the people in hell will be women. And yet if a believer in heaven, a male believer, has all these women as wives 
and yet there's not a you know there's a roughly a one to one ratio of men to women you got to have some you're missing some women here and within uh, Islamic thought there are these uh, additional women called Horis who are like H I believe it's O-U-R-I-S they're like blue eyed and very beautiful and they're like uh, created in heaven you know for the men's enjoyment hmm. so uh, we, we we have the majority of those in Hellfire being women right that doesn't that doesn't sound very fair though and, and it's because they're ungrateful to their husbands right now that once again is so contrasted to the biblical record of heaven I mean of hell because the, the people that go to hell according to the, the biblical record are the wicked the unrighteous and there's no distinction between men and women there it's people who deny or do not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, it's all these rings, but but sex has nothing to do with it. Uh, so we have a stark contrast there on, in heaven and hell with the biblical record, mm -hmm. as the Muslims see it. Now uh, we've only got five minutes left. We've got two key charts to get through, so okay. maybe we'll run fast through this next one and then uh, look at the last one here. All right. Women in the eyes of Islamic law. Well, it says narrate Abu Sa'id al Qudri. The Prophet said, "Isn't the witness of a woman half of that of a man?" The woman said, "Yes." He said, this is because of the deficiency of the women's mind. So in a court of law, uh, a w uh, the witness of a woman is only worth half of a man. And I've talked to some Muslims today who have tried, in America, who have tried to justify that by saying, well, it's because women are always forgetful of details and they need someone, uh, you know, another woman to like help them remember. Or it's like, well, they've just seen that women just in general aren't so intelligent, you know, at, 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 as men. And that's basically what Muslims believe today. And of course, uh, once again, that doesn't jive with scientific data. I know a lot of very intelligent women right. that put a lot of men to shame. Yep. So uh, once again, we have almost a, uh, a sexist, sexist uh, view from the Islamic persuasion. And of course, this affects all those Islamic countries mm -hmm. and their laws that we discussed earlier. Okay, let's get to this key chart here. This is, okay. I think, this is very important. Allah deceives. Okay. Now, Listen to the kind of Allah that would do something like this. And says, then only this nation, i.e. Muslims, will remain, including their hypocrites. So you got true Muslims and false Muslims together. Allah will come to them in a, in a shape other than they know and will say, I am your Lord. They will say, we seek refuge with Allah from you, meaning they don't accept him. This is our place. We will not follow till our Lord comes to us. And when our Lord comes to us, we will recognize him. Then Allah will come to them in a shape they know and will say, I am your Lord. They will say, no doubt, you are our Lord. They will follow him. This is Bukhari, volume 8, number 577, and Bukhari, volume 9, uh, 532. Now, which says basically the same thing. So Allah comes, and he has a de now, deceiving shape, and it doesn't say how they know what the physical shape of Allah looks like. And it says, I'm Allah. And so by his shape, he's deceiving them. And those who follow Allah, when he has deceiving shape, will basically go, you know, they're, they're the hypocrites. So mm -hmm. God deceives them. Now, in the Bible, it contrasted that. Hebrews 6.18 says, The God of Christianity, it is impossible for God to lie. If you ever say nothing's impossible to God with God, well, actually, the Bible does say two things are impossible to God. It's impossible for God to lie, and it's impossible in James uh, for God to be tempted by evil. Oh, it's also impossible for God to deny himself. Okay, so James 1.13 also says, God is... Uh, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anybody. So God may allow temptation, allow people to be deceived, but God of truth doesn't lie and doesn't deceive people. The, uh, the God of the Hadith, uh, you know, the Allah of the Hadith does. Mm -hmm. So this is another major contrast between mm -hmm. Christianity and Islam. Now, to wrap up the show, we we, we want to get back to the original question and the title of this series, which is, can believing a Muslim religion send someone to hell? Mm -hmm. Now, for about a minute or so, uh, just tell our audience about believing these Islamic teachings. Can they send you to hell? Okay, well, according to the Bukhara Hadith, volume 8, 577, volume 9, 532, which we've already looked at, if someone is following Allah, but Allah has a deceiving shape, then they will go to hell. Uh, and, 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 and so even in the Bukhari Hadith, it says that believing that in the wrong shape will go to hell. So how does a Muslim know when Allah is doing a deceiving shape? Uh, it doesn't really say. 
So a Muslim can think he's following Allah, but then get deceived by something. And, it, and, and at the end times during the judgment, right, it, 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 it is a context of this. But anyway, uh, in general, if the Bible is true and reliably preserved, Islam falls. Regardless if you're a Sunni Muslim who accepts the Hadith as authoritative, or if you're Shiite, Ahmadiyya, Alawite, or other kind of Muslim that does not, um, the, the messages are so different from the two that, uh, that if the Bible is true it, it, uh, it, and, and reliably preserved, then, then Islam falls. Well, we already established from show number one in this series that the Bible is established by thousands of manuscript copies going back in time, church history, uh, church uh, fathers going back in time, writing about what the Bible says, quoting the Bible. That all predates Islam 600 years before Muhammad. And we have and the manuscripts we, today. And we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the evidence is all there, scientifically verifiable, and archaeology and all the rest. Uh, but when we go to Islam, we have to go to, well, women are deficient in their minds, and, and we need a cure, we need an antidote for uh, disease, and, and my jokes, uh, <laughs> with a fly. Uh, so, uh, you know, all this is unscientific, unverifiable. Uh, questionable and shaky, mm -hmm. and yet people throw away what's verifiable in the Scripture, the Bible, and go with this other thing. Well, our time is up. We have to we have to sign off for now, Steve. Uh, I want to thank our viewers for being with us. I'm Larry Wessels with Christian Answers, and my co-host here in this series, Steve Morrison, our director of research with Christian Answers. If anyone desires a uh, free newsletter, a Christian Answers newsletter, or uh, a free resource list, or tracks and literature that we have on Islam, uh, be, feel free to write or call our numbers that appear at the end of the program. And we'll be more than glad to send you this material free of charge. Well, thanks again for being with us. Remember, Jesus is the sinless one. He is the, the one that we should put our trust in. Follow him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, John 14, 6. And that's what we want you to focus your attention on. Join us next week. Until then, God bless you all. What is Jesus' gospel which he entrusted to his apostles? The answer can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, which states, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance that I also receive, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as it were to one untimely born, he, he appeared to me also. All of this is attested to by Jesus' own disciples, eyewitnesses, and apostles, along with manuscript and early church history. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 